Hello. Amazing. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Howard. Welcome to this session, Best Practice in Delivering Successful Open Source Engagement in Organizations. It sounds more professional and corporate than it probably is. Um, it's going to be far more informal and more about an opportunity to share. Uh, but it's great to see some of you here today. Uh, so I'm the uh, open source lead at EPAM and a digital transformation consultant. Uh, but I'm also an Open UK ambassador, and you might have noticed there in the corner over there promoting the three Opens uh, in the UK. I'd really encourage you to go and have a chat if you're not familiar with them. Uh, and I also sit on the Finos DNI, um, Finos DNI Special Interest Group as the com Community Partnerships Lead. So any of you who are interested in perhaps pursuing an engagement there, do, do try and find me later over a drink or lunch. I'd love to have a chat. So the EPAM open source office, we, we do two things. We're a services vendor, so not a pure kind of financial services. We do our community piece, which is about building our internal community and our external kind of reputation. And then secondly, which is our consultancy offering. So helping our clients with their open source adoption and maturity, but also helping our project managers, our delivery managers, our engineers with their own consultancy questions around how to embrace uh, open source. So I promise this is the first and last slide you'll see about EPAM. This is not a sales pitch, um, but I just wanted to say, obviously you're thinking, well, why is this guy still at the front telling us about best practice? Well, hopefully this kind of sets the scene a little bit. So we're super proud of kind of our reputation within open source and certainly some of the key metrics you can see there, uh, as well as our contributions. Uh, so certainly through the kind of opportunities that present to us in kind of engagement with our clients, other organizations, we've really been able to kind of quantify our, our efforts and our kind of skill set here around why we feel we can perhaps share some of our insight in open source. So I promise this will be the last time we see it, but we'll, we'll move on. What's also really important and perhaps ironic is that this presentation isn't consultancy. So this is best practice. This is just me sharing some of the kind of experiences, perspectives we've had through talking to our clients, engaging with other organizations. And there's no models, no frameworks, no approaches. Don't worry, we're not going to go super technical sales pitch here. It is, if you like, just some things that I like. It's a set of practices that perhaps we've borrowed from organizations who are doing great things in open source, as well as perhaps some of their own process with processes we've introduced into our own organization. And in the spirit of open source, lots of the stuff we're going to talk about today is available and out there online. Things like the, the Linux Foundation, Inner Source Commons, To Do Group, blogs, resources, lots of groups out there have fantastic resources that I'd really encourage you to pick up. And certainly what we do when we're engaging with our clients is share that messaging too. As well, of course, though, many of the things that I mentioned, we do have within EPAM, and that's kind of why we're here today to share that. But for us, innovation in open source strategy is really, really pivotal to kind of pushing forward. So when we see new initiatives being piloted or new opportunities that other organizations are trying, we absolutely jump onto that and try to include some of those more kind of groundbreaking initiatives within this. So we're going to approach this through kind of two things. And we heard this reference this morning. So consumption and contribution. So consumption, as we're aware, that's around the practices, the ideas associated with adopting open source solutions. And then contribu contribution, that's around the ideas, tools, processes of contributing back into open source. And, and everything I mentioned kind of touches one of those two camps. And lots of these practices, it's really important to call out, can be applied to inner sourcing. And I'm not necessarily going to speak about inner sourcing within the scope of this presentation, but lots of them are relevant. And certainly have seen some great organizations really pushing forward the boundary of inner sourcing culture where their consumption and perhaps contribution to open source isn't necessarily as strong. So let's get stuck in. Uh, my kind of first thing, my, my number one is awareness. So if you think back to that EPAM slide at the beginning that I said I wouldn't mention again, how are you shouting about your kind of open source engagement? What does your awareness look like? Not just internally, but how are you doing that externally? And there's some real success stories around organizations who are, who are really championing this awareness. Can you confidently say within your organization, where is the, the Yammer, the Slack, the team space that your OSPO, your open source uh, entity exists at? And if you are new to the company, a new developer, a new engineer, whoever this happens to be, can they Google or search open source within your organization to find where that single source of truth is, that one point of reference? And how do those engineers even know what you're engaging in within open source if you don't have a single point of reference where you're, you're talking about it? How does anyone know if you have any policies or strategy? All of these useful documents that we're all familiar with, or indeed we allude to, where are they living within the organization? Super important to find that. So it does cover lots and lots of areas, things like onboarding, policy, charters, et cetera. A client we were working with, a large automotive company, 
they actually built into their entire onboarding process and a single module on open source. That's about the benefits of open source, license considerations, into their entire IT policy onboarding. This impacted every single individual in the organization. So they were learning about how that was a core part of their activity just by that onboarding process to the organization. Now that's not applicable to everyone. It doesn't work for every organization. But if you're making a strategic decision to bring open source into the forefront of your business, then obviously it makes critical sense to include that in your onboarding material. Policy as well. Now, we can all get held up on policy, and there's loads of guidance out there, and we can have massive documents, tiny documents, small things, bullet points, etc. I really encourage you to look at the to-do group. They have some really great framework frameworks on this. They have a model strategy document. Uh, but also, to go back to that point about point of reference, don't make employees search for this. This should be readily available and accessible for all in the organization. At EPAM, what we have is something called a charter. So this is our open source charter, and it basically is an agreement. It, employees don't opt into it. it, it's there by virtue. If you're an employee of EPAM, you, you've agreed to this charter by receiving your salary at the end of the month, I suppose. But it says you can use our equipment, you can use our email address, you can even use your time within the company as long as your project manager approves. But please just don't disclose any confidential information. And more importantly, don't open source something that perhaps a client's paid us to, to build again. That probably doesn't make quite sense. But for us, it's a super accessible charter, five or six bullet points, and it says explicitly, you can do this. It's much easier. No one needs to send emails, difficult things. I want to focus on this. And we found that that's been a really, really valuable one for our engineers who perhaps don't want the, the rigmarole of having to get delivery manager approval, seek compliance questions, et cetera. But a big one within this scope of awareness for me is leadership. And this is more and more we heard this morning around the idea of chief open source officers. This is around getting that executive awareness and support. So we can have business leaders who might be open source advocates. And I certainly lead the open source office, but I really leverage our CTO or CIO, for example, to have those hard hitting home messages, that kind of business cases that they need to push forward. That's invaluable for me. I'm a, an element of a figurehead in the organization, but when our CTO is championing open source and really selling that, that messaging to the, to the wider organization, as well as externally, that has so much more power behind it. But also, how can you make your employees champions of open source? And culture, of course, you wouldn't mention that one. Who are the blockers to open source engagement? The question I always ask here is, this is not about shifting and designing a brand new culture, although there's value in that. It's instead finding who are those people that are restricting or the, the reluctance to change of that culture and then shifting their perception. What are their misunderstandings, their misconceptions around the risks of open source? And how can we as open source champions and advocates change that and shift that, that idea? And that's a really interesting thing and there's some, some great thought leadership out there as well. We all know the risks associated, but it's about educating the people that perhaps are a little more naive for want of a better term. Next, freedom to engage. I think this is super important and many of our engineers really, really are on the ball with this. This is what extent of freedom do employees in the organization have to bring open source solutions into the organization. So this is not contributing. This is around, I want to use this library. I want to use this accelerator. Can I bring that in? And what's the process I have to follow? Well, this is around what approvals, gateways, hurdles need to be overcome, if any. And there are some great organizations out there who've managed to narrow that down to just a few box ticking exercises. But on the other side of the spectrum, there are organizations out there who you've got to send documents, sign off processes, approvals, which has a time and a place. So it's about asking yourself, are we, are we really doing this for the sake of it? Or is this a, an unnecessary challenge that our developers are facing? Additionally, who's checking this? What, what tools are we built in? What processes is this? There's some clients out there who've got automated compliance checks, audit logs, lots of clever stuff doing that, some AI. Uh, at the same time, there's one client of ours who's got a, a wiki page. It's 300 rows of open source solutions and tools that have been approved, signed off the agreement. Any developer can go onto that page and say, oh, are we using this library? Are we using this dependency? And it's there available. And it's not very fancy. It's not exotic. But it shows, yes, this was approved in 2016. Go ahead and use it. There's no need to pursue that avenue anymore. And that's really, really valuable. And of course, there's nothing wrong with a wiki page once in a while. And we saw this morning as well in the report, there's some really high percentages around that lack of support or provision within the financial services at the moment for consuming open source. So we should be asking ourselves as leaders or advocates of open source, what's blocking that behavior? Is it going back to that education piece? Are there misunderstandings? What can we be doing to really give this freedom to those individuals to engage? 
And we don't have one in EPAM, and we don't necessarily provide this consultancy opportunity to, to many of our clients, but open source review boards are, are a really good start. So I'm going to read this out because the to-do group define it a bit better than me, but the OSRB is in charge of creating an open source compliance strategy and a set of processes that determine how a company will implement these rules on a daily basis. Well, that goes back to the idea around approvals, audits, reapprovals. If you can have a small team who are dedicated to that function, to being able to review those processes, provide that approval, and that's their, their core kind of momentum, then absolutely let's empower them to, to bring that process through as streamlined as possible and really enable people to adopt and consume open source within your organization. But at the same time, it shouldn't be a cumbersome process. And there's a, a, an, an analogy that I like. It's, it's better to be streamlined and lean and get 100% of your engineers following that process than perhaps only get the 50% because the other 50% are cutting corners or are avoiding that process because they don't necessarily want to go through all of those hurdles. So lean and small is efficient and great and has some value. I appreciate there's audit and governance and compliance issues, but we don't want something super big because then we run the risk of losing developers and engineers who don't want to go through that process. So talking about developers or wider contributors, because of course we keep hearing it's not just about engineers within open source, brings me to the area that I'm super interested in, and that's recognition. So this is finding and celebrating those who are contributing to open source in your organization. And that, for me, doesn't have to be organization specific. This should be related, in my opinion, to open source in any element outside of the organization, outside of that delivery project. And if you ask me what would be the one thing we've transformed at EPAM, I would say this is how we recognize our contributors to open source and continue to do so in the organization. So more and more companies, I believe, are recognizing that contribution to personal projects, irrespective of the value to the organization, is a great thing. It's about being a good open source citizen, and there's a real talent kind of retention, acquisition value in that, and I'd really celebrate organizations that are recognizing that. But more importantly, what comes with recognition is reward. And it's surprising how many organizations actually don't track contributors in their organization. They've got little to no idea who is contributing to open source, and let alone what they're contributing to or how they're contributing. So it's impossible, therefore, to, to reward them. And the risk of not rewarding them, where open source is such a big factor of their organization, is the attrition. So it's really important to get that monitoring piece in place. Now, this could be a simple metric versus a very complex system. Uh, and it's not just about enabling those who lead the OSPO to then recognize how many contributors they've got. It's going back to that first slide, the one I said I wouldn't mention again, to have that opportunity to say, well, this is what we're doing. This is how many contributors we've got. This is how many push events, our commits, our solutions. And a quick win might just be linking the GitHub ID to your HR system, something like Work, Workday, SAP. If you link that up immediately, you know, OK, yes, it's, a, it's a, a narrow function, but we've got this many contributors, and we can see this number, and it's growing as we onboard more and more talent. But it could also be about inviting employees, perhaps, to put their open source projects on their internal CVs or your resourcing tools. That's something they're proud about and celebrating. Why do we not bring that into that internal hiring and, and retention piece as well? At EPAM, we built and we maintain a tool called the Open Source Contributor Index. And it's available at opensourceindex.io. And that, map, that tracks contributors globally in terms of their active contributors. We then took that a step further and we enhanced that to be an internal tool. And we now, which we love, uh, and I, get, I spend a lot of time on it, have a tool that tracks us in real time all of our contributors in the organization, the repos they're contributing to, the, the frequency, the push events, the geographies, lots of exciting data that we've then been able to match with our HR systems to get some kind of demographic and DNI piece. But as I said at the beginning, this isn't consultancy, but if you've got questions on what that tool looks like, then let's have a, have a conversation at the end of the day. But also, perhaps, why not include things like open source engagement in end of year reviews or award badges or whatever gamification techniques you have in your organization? Those small, tiny steps to recognize that open source activity that your colleagues and, and employees are doing does have an absolute positive impact on them enjoying their, their kind of place of work. And finally, if you've got some big names or some big maintainers in your organization, then provide them a platform, give them a forum to talk about that. It doesn't look just great for your organization of being a champion of that and an advocate. But it also allows you to celebrate their successes and what they're contributing to within the open source world. So thinking about what those contributors are doing, therefore, brings us on to releases. So this is something we do a lot, uh, and we're really, really proud of this. And many of the member organizations that are here today as well is about releasing those internal solutions out to the wider world. 
And it's great to have people like Finos and people like Gab and Mao, etc., holding our hands when we're contributing solutions inwards to Finos, and that's fantastic. But as we heard from Deutsche Bank this morning, for example, lots of those solutions also go elsewhere. So this is not just about solutions going into the Finos uh, ecosystem. So what channels therefore exist to get that innovation and that ploy ideas out to the world? Well, there are some really successful release processes in organizations around open source, but at the same time, there are probably equal, if not more terrible ones. Uh, and for me, it's really important that these processes are transparent and accessible for all. So going back to that idea of a single point of truth, there really shouldn't be any surprises in a release process. And in engineers who hit one of those hurdles, the worst thing to do is then drop off and we lose that solution. That could be something that's going to be the diamond that changes the financial services industry tomorrow. So we want to make sure that that release process is as streamlined and, uh, and as efficient as possible with just the right amount of legal and governance, which we'll come to. But our release process is visible for everyone. It's not a case of asking a question. You can log on, you can see the process, and you can also see every solution that's gone through that. So you can see their communication deck or their kind of product brief. You can see the questions that were asked, the pushback that came from compliance, the challenges that came from legal, and you can see the email threads that were born out of that. So if you really want to jump in and you say, okay, we've had these problems with this license or moving from this library dependency, all of that detail's there. And for us, that's really, really valuable because it empowers those individuals to start to make their own decisions around release processes, pushing things out. It removes an onus on us. We still have some foresight, but it empowers them to feel passionate about, this is my solution. I get what the challenges are, and I'm going to make this recommendation. Now, of course, if you have a review board, et cetera, we can jump in and we, and we have an extent of auditing at the same time, but it's really, really important to, to empower them to feel like they can push their solutions out. And as I say here as well, it's about stripping out those unnecessary stages. So having someone within that process who can take a lead on topics of legal and governance is much more valuable, in my opinion, than not having someone available to handhold over those topics. So there's certain things we can empower engineers and developers to go forward and move on, license choices, dependencies, security audits to an extent. But if we have someone within the organization, and I'll talk about that in a second, who's really knowledge about the legal and the governance compliance pieces, then that's the opportunity at that stage where they can guide them through that process and say, this is a concern, this is not, et cetera. And as an OSPO lead, of course, there's value, for example, in me knowing about license considerations. But at the same time, I really believe there's value in allowing someone or a tool to specialize in that, perhaps automation. I can have the awareness, but I think there's much more better people out there or better opportunities out there for specific details around those and use those to your, to your advantage and benefit. And for us, what's had massive value, and certainly when we talk to some of our clients, in particular the automotive one I, I referred to, having someone within the global legal function, and in this benefit, in this case, one of the global council members was specifically engaged with open source, provides such a level of reassurance of a simple kind of yes, proceed, than it does for a, a junior developer to have to write an email considering the legal complications, et cetera. And finally, on this topic, FAQs. Don't undermine FAQs. So when you've got that in giant long email thread of everything that was discussed and finally you get the answer you're looking for at the top, then turn that into a learning exercise. So take that email thread. Don't just pop it into your outbooks, uh, wherever it happens to be, your folder in Outlook. Take that, turn it into an FAQ, pop it onto an, an accessible page, and then you're slowly building your own library, your own knowledge base of all of those challenges. And we found that super useful. And finally, well, how long does this process take? Well, in EPAM, it takes about two weeks to get something from initial product brief or communication deck, as we call it, through to getting its own repo on GitHub and us being able to shout about it. But in some organizations, two to three days. As an aspiration, perhaps there's some complications there. I know financial services has a bit more of a compliance and, and governance complications to it. But yeah, this is, it, it can be done. And it's super exciting to see organizations really en enabling that activity to happen. So it wouldn't make sense today to not talk about community and event like today. Now, there's internal community that we've just alluded to and recognition of contributors, and external communities such as Finos, Apache, Drupal, et cetera. And we saw again in the report this morning lots of percentages around lower numbers of external contributions from financial services. And I really think that's where organizations like Finos and those external engagements provide an opportunity to educate those decision makers, those business leaders, on why we should be contributing more to open source. So maintaining that awareness around what the industry is doing, having that finger on the pulse, 
but also being a key player in setting the, the roadmap, the transformation kind of route as to what that solution is changing in. Take an example like Drupal, for example, defining the backlog, taking our ideas, steer, being instrumental in that process provides an awful lot of weight and value for, for those business makers to say, okay, we were, we were part of this process. So there's lots of advice out there on, on how you might be able to perhaps convince those stakeholders, those business owners, and of course, more than happy to pick that up. But in terms of community as well, the, the, the ideas of goals, objectives, forums, and working groups. One of these innovative things I've seen recently are kind of open source PI planning. So in the, in the scope of kind of agile and safe ways of working, a PI planning. So it's about providing a forum to, to build a roadmap of features, of objectives, things you want to achieve within your open source, uh, object, uh, open source program office but also having everyone in the room, that, that idea of a big room to kind of put forward ideas, challenges, a bit of a working group almost. How are you communicating that roadmap? How are you setting the business context of where, I don't know, EPAM's going in terms of our open source engagement? Now, Finos are amazing at this. They are always on my case around using the issues function on GitHub to talk about what's going on, assign actions, tag people, etc. And I love that idea, but even me trying to get my own team and, and developers on board to do this has had some challenges. So th th there's work to do that, absolutely. And I'm really keen to hear maybe some success stories around how we've done that, because I would love to see more open source organizations being externally kind of honest and transparent in terms of what they're doing in that space. And particularly, a, a point on this, is taking a step back and saying, where does open, sit, open source sit within the organization? Is it a silo? Uh, is it a stream? Is it an umbrella across that? Does it sit like it does at EPAM underneath the CTO function? Or is it a facet of kind of engineering excellence? Make sure that you're aligning open source activity with organization objectives and goals. Uh, and what makes sense for your overall kind of roadmap and business goals anyway? Town halls, any excuse to talk about open source, take them. Uh, and if we increase that awareness, then we in turn increase the chance of engagement. So I appreciate absolutely that we've covered a lot. Uh, and certainly, I've, I've made lots and lots of questions and made some observations. I did promise there wouldn't be any diagrams or frameworks, just a kind of text-based uh, slides. But it has been a real pleasure to share with you some of those insights. And I think at conferences like today, we hear lots of kind of lessons learned, messages, et cetera, uh, and lots of interesting things I've already heard. But as I said right back at the beginning, there's so many resources out there already um, that I would really encourage people to just get on Twitter, get onto some of those blogs, podcasts, and listen into those. Feel free to follow me on Twitter, engage with me that way, maybe even ask me some questions about consultancy, but it's been a real pleasure to, to speak to you today. Thank you.